Hello, everyone. Welcome to Hello, our everyone. channel. I hope you can hear me all right. Wherever you are, please, if you can hear me, just give me hi in the chat uh, comment description so that I can see that you can hear me. Today, we are going to talk about uh, an important uh, visa uh, issue. We are going to talk about F1 visas, B1 visas, or non immigrant visas, and particularly. We are going to talk about proving ties to your home country. Proving ties to your home country. There are a lot of concerns, a lot of questions about uh, how people can prove ties to, to their home country. So uh, in this video, we are going to specifically look at these uh, issues, right? How you can prove ties to your home country. When you go for your visa interview, uh, many people get rejected. And the letter that they receive is what we call the 214B letter, basically explaining or telling you that you didn't prove ties to your home country. What it means is that the consular believes that when you come to the United States or Canada, you would not return. So what are the factors? What are the things you must consider when you are applying for visa, especially when it comes to proving ties to your home country? Now, First of all, let us understand that if you are applying for non-immigrant visa, right, the purpose of your visa is for a temporary stay in the U.S. So you have to come to the United States, do whatever you are coming to do, whether it is for visits, it's for business or vacation, do whatever you are coming to do and after return. If you are a student, the, the F1 visa you get requires that after you are done with your studies, you return. That is the, the rule governing the visa application, actually. So the consulates are looking for people who meet this rule. And that is why it is important that when you go for your interview, you demonstrate that there is a good reason for you to return to your home country. You demonstrate that after whatever you are coming to do in the U.S., you'll be faithful to return to your home country. And demonstrating that is very difficult. And it's not difficult to demonstrate, but it is difficult to convince the consular about it. Because the records do not lie. The records show that a lot of Africans, a lot of people, non-immigrants, come into the United States and they don't return. They come into the United States, some abuse their visas. They come into the United States and uh, purposely to, to have a living. And the purpose of your visa is not to have a living. So because of past records, because of uh, uh, precedence, the consulates have so many reasons to believe that when we go for the interview, we will not return. So when you go for the interview, the consular assume that every person, and it's, that is the law, is a potential immigrant. It means that once you show up at the interview, you are already placed at a point of zero. There's no trust. The consular do not trust you. So you have to make the consular trust you. So what are the things that you need to consider when you are applying for your visa, especially when it's come to proving your ties to your home country? Many people who, have, who are rejected F1 or visitors visa, most of the reason or one of the important reasons, a uh, reason why people are denied is because they are not able to show that they will return after their studies or after they are visit. Now, <clears throat> with that in mind, how do we prove ties to our home country? There are a lot of videos on that. Personally, uh, on our channel, we've made a lot of videos on that. And the videos seem simple. Basically, there are so many ways you can prove ties to your home country. One, through your family ties, explaining and showing that you have a family commitment that will bring you back to your home country, right? That is one. Two, employment ties or financial ties. So here you are showing that the kind of work that you are doing will bring you to your home country. Very, very important. And assets, right? So people use their assets. But one thing that people don't understand is that 
these are generally the rules. But how you present this story to the consola is key. Because if you are a student and you are coming to study and you are using family ties, assuming you are married, you have a wife, you have a child, right? And you are coming to study. And you are saying that you return to your home country because you have a wife and a child. That, that will not make enough sense to the consola. Because the visa that you are applying for as a student also qualifies you to even bring your spouse, bring your children. So the fact that you are coming to the U.S. to come and study, and the fact that you have a family back home in Ghana or in Nigeria, it's not enough reason to prove to the consular that you will return. It's not enough reason. Because when you come, you get your visa, your wife can also actually apply to join you. It is this, the same thing applied to having an asset. Assuming you go to the embassy with a bunch of papers showing that you have cars, you have buildings and all that, you can still show these documents, get your visa, and afterwards sell them. So it is not just about having these things or having documents to prove. It is about how you present it to the consular. And that is where most of us get it wrong. We have a very good profile. We are married. We, have, we are doing a good job. We have a lot of assets. But when you go to the interview, the consular still tell, uh, tells us that we don't qualify because they don't believe you return. And we wonder, why? why? Why don't we qualify? Why don't we believe? Or why don't they believe? It is because you didn't present your story very well. Now, if you are coming for visitor's visa and... Uh, so here I'm trying to push you to where you should look out, right? look out for. If you are coming for visitors visa, and you are working, right? You are a teacher, you are a nurse, you are you are you are doing your own good business, right? And it is not just the kind of business you are doing; it is the flow of income that comes through the business. So assuming you are you are doing your own business, assuming you are a teacher, you are a lecturer, and whatever. When you go for the interview, the consular is assessing your ties to your home country based on what you are doing in your home country. The kind of job you are doing, your status in your home country will decide whether you return or not. Right? So sometimes people get rejection even because of their status. As a student, people get F1 visa rejected because of their current status in their home country. Right, so it is important that when you go for your interview, whilst you are thinking about the assets, the documents, all those things that you have, you should be able to present yourself, market yourself enough to the consular to believe that you have a good status in your home country. So, if you are coming as a student, right, how do I present that I have a good status? It doesn't mean you should be working with a good company or a big company or earning enough money. No. It doesn't mean you should you should uh, uh, be having your own business as somebody who wants to come and study. No. It all depends on your status. What are you doing? Why is what you are doing relevant? Why is it relevant? So I always use myself as an example. And it doesn't mean that you should go with this example. This is one of the examples that comes into mind. I went for the first interview, and the consular asked me, what do I do? And I said, I'm a youth leader. And the consular asked me, okay, so why am I coming to study? The consular didn't go forward to push me to explain what youth leader means. I just tell the consular I'm a youth leader. So at that point, the consular formed his own opinion about my status in my home country. He realized that I don't have a proper status. Even I couldn't even name my status. I said, I'm a youth leader. What form of youth leader? Right? So... I should have explained specifically what I was doing. So in my second interview, I have to correct that. And in most cases, when the consular asks you what you are doing, the answer you give will decide whether your visa will be approved or not. So in my second interview, the consul asked me, what do you do? I said, oh, I work with this church as the leader of the, of the youth. Because of that, I have opportunity to train the youth to organize workshop and, and talk about issues of justice and embark on youth employment empowerment programs. Now, through this response, 
I was able to show the consular my status. I wasn't earning money. I wasn't rich. But I was able to present a story that tells my relevance in my country. That tells my heart for my country. That tells what I'm doing. That presents my status as somebody who is relevant to my church and to my country. So the consular asks, you said you were a youth leader at, with, uh, in your church at that highest level because I was the national president of the entire youth. And I said, yes. And he said, okay, so have you traveled outside Ghana before? And that was the point that advantage for me. And I said, yes, I've been outside Ghana for two years or two times and all that. It doesn't mean you your story should meet my story, but I'm using my story as an example, especially from my first interview to my second interview to demonstrate to you why your status matter, the kind of status you are in in your home country, why it matters in establishing your ties to your home country. So if you are a student or if you are somebody coming for studies and you are doing your national service, when you go for the interview and the consular asks you, what are you doing? It is important. It is not enough to say, I am doing my national service. National service is what? You can go ahead to say, I'm currently doing my national service with a small community uh, in, in a, a sutra. I am a mathematics teacher. And when I went to the community, I realized that there's no mathematics teacher. So even though I was assigned to DA primary school, I also work with the Presby school and the Methodist school because they don't have a mathematics teacher. In this answer, for example, it doesn't demonstrate that you are rich. It doesn't demonstrate that you are married. It doesn't demonstrate that you have an asset. But it demonstrates your status to your home, your status in your home country. It demonstrates your responsibility. So the consulates are looking for people who are responsible. That is what I mean. So when you want to prove ties to your home country, it is not about what you have. It is also about what you do and how you present that. So people go for the interview and they come out and they are like, the consular didn't ask me anything about my home, um, uh, about my ties to my home country. No. When the consular asks you, why are you going to the, to, why are you coming to the U.S. to study? For example, you go for the interview and your first question is, pass me your I-20. You give the I-20 to the consular and say, okay, so tell me why you are going to the United States. Now, many people go straight to answer this question by giving the consular why. And that is okay. In most cases, it helps because that is the question that the consular is, is asking. But in some cases, you must tell the consular who you are and add why. Because the consular have never met you, doesn't know you. If he has chance, then he can glance through your DS-160 to check who you are and have a brief overview about your background. So it is important to introduce within 30 seconds a brief background about yourself. Why are you going to the United States? I'm going to the United States to study my master's in chemistry. I've been teaching as a chemi uh, chemistry teacher in this school uh, for the past 13 years. And uh, then you continue. Then you introduce yourself. You give your status to the consular. You give what you are doing to the consular. You are going coming for a visitor's visa and the consular asks you, why do you want to visit the U.S.? Then you say, oh, I want to visit the U.S. because uh, I want to take a vacation, visit my uncle who is in California. It's been a long time I visited my uncle, so I want to visit him. Ask who? Who are you? What is your status? So the consular will go ahead and say, okay, who is funding? Who is sponsoring it? Oh, I'm sponsoring myself. Uh, I work. Or this person is sponsoring me. The consular will be like, okay, you don't qualify for the visa. Please feel free to reapply. And you are like, ah. But he didn't ask me anything about ties. When he asks you, what are you going to the United States? It was an opportunity for you to explain who you are. Give the consular a little bit of information. So you must understand that the visa laws are related. They are related in the form of response, especially in our part in Africa. Because a lot of people are rushing through to get their visas. A lot of people are moving around to get their visas. They are, they are going so, like... The embassy is overcrowded. The embassy is working beyond their capacity. And they cannot approve every visa. So they are looking for people who demonstrate that they need their visa. Who demonstrate that they qualify for your visa, for their visas, right? So as a student, how do you prove ties to your home country? 
I have always said the best way to prove ties to your home country as a student is to use your academic plans. Why is the course so important to you? Why do you want to study this program? What is the benefit? And what is in the next 10 years, who, who will you be? And based on that, where will you be? So as a student, you don't have to own an asset. You don't have to marry. You don't have to get a girlfriend. And there are some people, they go for the interview and the consular asks them, are you married? And they are like, no, but I have a girlfriend. You are, that's not the question the consular is asking you. The question is, are you married? Yes, I am not married. <laughs> if you say, no, but I have a girlfriend. Uh, having a girlfriend is not a tie to hope. You don't have any commitment to this girlfriend. Even married people sometimes travel and they break up. How, how much more a girlfriend? A girlfriend is not a tie to your home country, right? So when the consular, when you go for the interview, the consular is concerned about who you are, about what you want to do with the degree. Why do you want to seek that degree? That is also a form of connecting it to your home country. Because sometimes the purpose for which you are seeking the degree will determine whether you would you, you return to your home country with the degree or not. <laughs> Assuming you go to the embassy and the consular asks you, why do you want to study uh, business analytics? And so I want to study business analytics because I've seen that in the US, there's a market for business analytics uh, or people who work in that sector. So I believe that after school, it will give me opportunity to explore the market. Right now, let's let's go to another important issue with ties to home. The next thing about ties to home is your funding. People don't know that the structure of your funding can decide, can determine, it, it can prove to the consular whether you will return to your home country after school or not. And I'm going to explain. Pay attention. The structure of your funding, right? So in most cases, we say that those who are who are going, who have full funding, right? If you have a full scholarship from your school or something, it's an added advantage. And this category, what I'm coming to say, does not apply to those people, right? But now, what I'm coming to say applies to people who didn't receive any funding from the school. Or even if they received funding from the school, it wasn't enough, so they had they had to go for additional uh, money, either personal money, either from their, 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 uh, from, from their family or from whoever. So, if you are in that category, I want you to uh, I want you to pay attention. The structure of your funding can decide whether you return to your home country or not. Assuming you get a school, right, and you didn't get funding, but first, let me deal with this category. But first, you receive money from your government, like Ghana, Ghana National Secret Scholarship Secretariat or a district assembly common fund is sponsoring you. You receive money from your government. That shows a form of ties to your home country because all these scholarships, especially government scholarship, have requirements for returning to your home country. And you don't have to prove that you return. It is, it is, the, it is the, the requirement of the scholarship. So if the consular understand that the requirement of the scholarship is to return to your home country after your studies to come and support your country or whatever, in effect, that is a proof to you, that is a tie to your home country. Basically, what we are saying is that when your government sponsors you, there's some kind of connection between you and your government, which can, in effect, as a student, bring you back to your home country. Your, the scholarship surround the, the 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 regulation surrounding your scholarship demands that you return. The next category is people who are being funded by their organization, by their churches, or by their companies. And here, let me let me clarify. A lot of people go for the interview and they are like, "Oh, I I am sponsored by my uncle. My uncle owns a company, and my uncle is sponsoring me with this amount of money." What is so critical about this when it comes to home country, ties to your home country is that if your uncle's financial statement, which is company, is a small and a small, we call it SMS, right? A small and medium company, small and medium company, good. 
if it is in that category and your uncle is making hundred thousand dollars right hundred thousand dollars that is what you have in your bank statement is it hundred thousand yes hundred thousand dollars okay okay that is what you have in your bank statement now you go and your uncle is using fifty thousand dollars out of this money to sponsor you to come and study medicine to come and study all related company program that tells the consoler something why is your uncle depleting 50 percent of his company capital to give it to you come to come and study all related program something that that doesn't have any connection to the line of 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 his work man you your uncle also have family right so when I, when i'm talking about company sponsorship i'm talking about people who have proper connection with their company they are working perhaps they are working with car bank they are working with fidelity bank they are working with a, a, a private hospital they are working with a company a, whoever and in the company there is a requirement to train there is a requirement to sponsor student and in that case they sponsor student to go and study so you go and prove that you are coming to study because you work with this company as S and Y, and through your work, your company is sponsoring you to come and study uh, a, a specific program that will meet a specific company need. Such scholarship as well also have requirement to return to your home country. I have coached a lot of pastors who easily get their visas because they have sponsorship letters from their church. And the sponsorship letter is basically saying that this person is a member of our church. We are looking for Christian educators or people who are interested in counseling and psycho counseling and chaplaincy. So we are willing to sponsor him to go and study for two years before he will return. Set scholarships are a proof of ties. You are connected. So indirectly, your ties are connected to the company as a student. Now, the next category of people is people coming with loans. Loans. L-O-A-N-S. Loans. Now, people don't know that you can take loans to come and study. Yes, you can take loans to come and study. There's nothing wrong with going for a loan. But the amount of money you are, you are requiring to bring in loan, the amount of money you have on your I-20 as a student, right, as loan, will determine to the consular whether you will return to your home country or not. And I'm going to explain. Assuming you are coming to study a uh, master's in psychology, or you are coming to study a uh, master's in, uh, in education, basic education, master's in chemistry or whatever. Now, you have a loan of $65,000. You have a loan of $50,000. This is per annum. So ideally, it means that at the end of your program, if you went for a loan of $40,000, at the end of, of your program, you, will need, you, you, you might have spent $80,000. Now, think about it this way. What you are coming to study require a loan of $80,000 at the end of the loan uh, of your study period. How will you demonstrate to the consular that when you graduate and you return to your home country because the visa requires you to return? So assuming you graduate with this degree that you took a loan for and return to your home country, do you have a ready market? Will you get a job that can pay you enough to pay $80,000? dollars so let's make basic mathematics here. The consolers are reasonable beings. They are people who, who raise it. And they know the system. They know what it means. And $80,000, for example, is not a joke. $40,000 is not a joke. So assuming at the end of your school period, you have spent $80,000. You come from Ghana. Even if we use current Ghana rates, $80,000... I'm going to use... Um, 13 cities. 
<laughs> this is eighty thousand dollars in Ghana cities. One million Ghana cities. Am I right? Yes. One million Ghana cities. So that that means after your the end of your studies, you spent one million Ghana cities. Now, this is where the consular will, will, will believe you not return. And I've come to explain. Now, when you come to your home country, prove to the consular what kind of job will you will you get with masters in psychology, masters in history, masters in physics, chemistry. What kind of job will you get? In Ghana, that can be that can help you pay this amount of loan. This is without the interest. Do you get the concept? So basically, as soon as you finish telling the consular how you are going to take a loan and how you are going to pay, he knows that when you return, there's no job you are going to get that can help you pay that amount of loan in Ghana. Assuming you get you return to Ghana and you earn. 10,000 Ghana cities a month. Or let me make it 20,000 Ghana cities a month, which is unlikely. Assuming I return to Ghana now with my master's, even from Yale, I'll not get a job that will give me 20,000. I'll not even get a job that will give me 10,000. 10,000 Ghana cities. So assuming I get a job that gives me 10,000 Ghana cities, let's, let's take it for that. Now, out of the 10,000 Ghana cities, I have to pay my rent and all that. So assuming at the end of the day, I'm able to say half, I'm, I'm paying half of 10,000 Ghana cities every month, right? Every month into this loan. How, how, how many months am I going to pay the loan? I'm going to pay this loan off. This is without the interest. I'm going to pay this loan in 208 months. Practically impossible. So, the kind of finances, the structure of your finances will determine whether you return to your home country or not. So the consultant will know that if you have huge sums of loan and you are coming to do a very good course or a sizable course, he knows that the prospect of you being tempted to remain and find job in the United States is higher. And listen, there's nothing that prevents any student, any person who comes to the U.S. Uh, to explore and look for a job. But for the purpose of the visa interview, at the point where you are going for the visa, your duty is to prove to the consular that even after school, after OPT, you will return. Even if you get a job, you are going to return to your home country. That is, that is what you need to prove to get your visa. So I want you to think about it. When you talk about ties to your home, home country, it involves a lot. And I believe that majority of you uh, have been rejected with 214B anywhere, asking yourself, why were you rejected? It involved a lot of uh, thinking, planning, and the way you present your story becomes necessary. On the loan issue, there's a student who was coming for, for MBA, and she went for a loan. Her loan was about 80, $85,000 uh, dollars a year. But you know what? She was able to get her visa because she said, the way she answered the question, she presented her loan in a form that was manageable and presentable to the consular. He explained how he has his own tier one or tier two. I don't know how, how, how uh, is it tier two? Her investment she has done over the period and that she had money in investment. The I-20 do not accept investment as a source of money because it is not liquid. And if she compared the interest on the loan to the interest, the per annum interest she would get on her investment, she believed that going for a loan is reasonable. And after school, she can use her, her investment to pay the loan because her investment was actually an educational fund that she invested in. It depends on the way you answer, right? There's somebody uh, that I remember, Paul Coach, he was coming to undergraduate. He had $50,000 scholarship. He was... Uh, sorry, $50,000 in loan, but he was able to explain breaking the loan into parts, sharing the loan responsibility between his mother, his, pay, uh, his father, his auntie, and his brother, who were also gainfully employed. And they were able to demonstrate that after school, they are going to share the burden of the loan among themselves, and they will pay the loan. And the consular believed him.
it depends on the way you present your answer. So proving ties to your home country, it's not about the assets you have. It's not about the, the, the you are married. All these things help. I'm not saying they don't help. They help. But there are so many ways you can prove ties without necessarily having a wife as a student. When, I, when we were all coming to the U.S., we were not married. Many people, when, you were coming to the U, uh, when they were coming to the U.S., they were not married, right? They didn't have an asset. They didn't have a, a land. Uh, nothing, <laughs> right, when uh, we were coming. And, and that should not stop us in getting our visas. At this point, I will open the door for uh, questions. If you have any question, please put it in the chat box, and I will respond to it in the next 20 minutes. Hello, brother. How are you? Uh, you are doing... Okay. Hello, brother. How are you? How are you doing? I really like your video. Great idea. Keep up. Uh, blood watching from uh, Dubai. Okay, traveler, thank you for your comment. I'm from Ghana. Have been seen. Sorry, your account has been blocked on Chrome, Mozilla, when applying for visa uh, appointment. Can I know the reason? Yeah, I think it's also happened to me sometime, right? So what you do, it also happened to me sometimes. So what you do is to use a different browser, right? Use a, a different browser, and I think it will work. That's what I do. I always use a different browser, and it works. Please keep your questions coming. Uh, if you need any, any help, please reach out to us on our contact. If you have any specific personal question, check our contacts and reach out to us. Good work uh, watching from Kenya. Thank you, Kamau. How long can you apply again after a denial? Ideally, you can apply three days, 72 hours after you are denied, right? So after you are denied, you can reapply if your situation has changed. It is very, very important. Hi, if you, you are already doing your master's here, is it advisable to say it? I know the answer is no. So what do I say? Why, why, why do you have to say no, right? If you're already doing your master's, like maybe your question is not complete but if do you mean if you're already doing your masters you are coming to do another masters i've seen a lot of people who are who are on their on their masters in ghana and they are coming for another masters right so it depends on your area your research interest and all that right so think about it that way i i there was i know someone who was doing master ma, he did a master of divinity in ghana but he came to do master of arts which is also another masters demonstrating why he will need that degree so you have to always explain you don't have to hide it sometimes that even helps you right that even helps you to demonstrate who you are and why you are coming to study perhaps what you are doing now uh, uh you are doing a master's but your research involves lab work and in your home country you have not had access to any lab work so you have not been able to complete your thesis or you couldn't focus on a certain aspect of your thesis so you apply you spoke to another professor, you applied, and he, he accepted you into his or her lab to work with, with her on this kind of project. So it's not, although it's a second master's, right, it is a specific project. There was somebody in the Telegram group who, who asked that he's in China and he's coming to the United States. He's already doing his, his master's in China. But because of the pandemic, he couldn't have access to do his practicals. And that was that that was not helpful. It didn't allow him to to focus on on the area of his research that he had to focus. So he had to reapply to another master's, which is slightly different. What is dangerous is applying to come and do the same master's. You are doing master's in project management, and you are you are apply to come and do master's in project management, or you are doing MBA finance, and you are applying to come and do MBA accounting. That is where it becomes a little bit challenging. But sometimes people based on their research interest. It becomes necessary to acquire more additional masters in that regard, right? So, for example, uh, I did Master of Divinity, and I, I'm doing a second master's, right? I'm, I'm completing a second master's because I needed a second master's to build on my language skills, to, to do more research in, in African studies and in history, because that is where my interest is. Very important. Okay, so uh, let's go through. This is from... Uh, Black Coast Multimedia, how do you prove ties if you are working for a local NGO and they are willing to sponsor you? Uh, 
uh, uh, Black Hoods. I think I've really explained all this, right? Explain that when somebody is helping you or sponsoring you, it, it, there are so many factors that involve. Why is the person sponsoring you and all that? And those who factor into uh, how you prove ties. So I that was one of the things I, I spoke on. So uh, just refer to that. Uh, Titus, me, Titus Mens. Is it my school father? He said, wow, Alfred. The way he's saying wow, he seems to. <laughs> my school father is called Titus, so I don't know if he's the one. Okay. Hello, brother. Thank you for the explanation. But please, how do I prove a strong tie as my uncle is my sponsor? So, if you think about the, the structure I give, right, I explain what the consulates are looking for. It's not just about your uncle sponsoring you. That is what you are going to use to prove ties. What are you coming to study? What are you coming to do? Why is your uncle sponsoring you? What is the need, right? And there are so many people who are being sponsored by their uncle, and that is okay. And they are able to get their visas because they are able to prove why their uncle is sponsoring them, right? Because whatever you are coming to do and, and, and all that, your uncle sponsorship must make sense in your own academic life. When I was, went for my first interview, they, were, they asked me, who is funding you? I said, my sister. They rejected me because I was coming to study uh, MD, which is basically in American context. That is what an average pastor needs, uh, a degree that you need to become a church person. So my sister is training me using her money over twenty thousand dollars to train me to become a pastor. It doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make any sense. Perhaps my sister could afford, but to the consola, it is not. It is the responsibility of a church, <laughs> or even myself, to train myself to become a pastor, right? So why will your sister, who has been able to save thirty thousand dollars, use twenty thousand dollars to give it to you too? Come and study to become a pastor. These are questions you always have to ask. If you're already doing your master's, one day ask why you want to move if you are not completed. That's what I, I've explained. If you are, you are you are not done with your master's and you want to move, why? Perhaps the kind of research you will need to complete your master's is not available in your home country. So because of that, you have to move. Perhaps you are doing a research on artificial intelligence and electronic cars. And you need electric cars to, to do your research. Here is the case in your home country. There's no generator even does not work. So it doesn't make sense. You cannot complete any good degree in elect, elect, electrical car manufacturing in, in your home country if you don't even have generator. If you don't, if you're electric, like you don't, you have not even seen one electric car. So if, if, it's an example I'm giving. So if you are telling the consular that I'm coming to the U.S. to come and study this program, and it's actually a transfer, right? So it is the story you tell, how you say it, right? Okay. Samuel Fori, how much will it cost an individual to request for coaching from you? Samuel Fori, please look at our uh, contact and reach out to us. Uh, our hope is to help so many people. Uh, so look at our contact and reach out to us through email and we'll talk to you about that uh, uh, in that regard. There are some, most people that we coach, we coach them for free. And there are some people, we have to compensate the coaches because of their time and all that. So reach out to us and let's look at that. We are, we, I think we also have discounts available for people like you. So please reach out, uh, baitlamat at gmail.com. Bro, what of those of us being sponsored by siblings in the US? Good. That's a very good question from Martin Usu. Now, anybody can sponsor you wherever they are in whatever currency. But if you go to the embassy and you say your sister is sponsoring you, your sister is a registered nurse, right, in the U.S., and let's say your sister earns between uh, eighty dollars to $100,000 a year. So that means that Let's make it hundred thousand dollars registered nurse. Yeah, okay, hundred thousand hypothetically a year divided by twelve. So every month, your sister is making eight thousand dollars. Now this is the case that you go to the embassy and you tell the consular that your sister is sponsoring you, and your sister is giving you 
30,000 or 40,000 dollars to come and study. So 100,000 100,000 minus 40,000. Basically, your sister is left with $60,000 to live on. Divided by 12. Every month, your sister is going to receive 5,000. And the consular asks, does your sister have children? So yes, she has two children. And that, that alone raises a question. That alone raises question. Because how can your sister spend 40% of her gross in sponsoring you financially does it make financial sense what will she gain why must she do that because the consulates understand the u.s system so well and they know basically the 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 how do how do i put it they know the annual income that people earn, and they also know the cost of living so if you if you are coming to study and you need 20000 and your uncle in the U.S. Who is, who is doing a very good job, maybe he works in one of the top companies, works with Microsoft or Apple, and is earning 500000 or $5 million a year, that makes sense, right? So the, the, kind, of, the, the kind of work your sibling, your parent, or the, your sponsor is doing in the U.S. is key because... A dollar is really a, is difficult to come by, and the consulates understand those systems perfectly. And and the concern is, why is your sister spending forty percent of her RN money to sponsor you? That is the question you need to answer. So your 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 the question you ask, Martin, it depends on the amount of money that your sponsor is sponsoring you with, the the kind of work your sponsor is 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 is, is doing. And also, since your siblings are in the U.S., you already have ties here in the U.S. You already have ties. So it is your responsibility to make the consular believe that despite your sister's sponsorship, you are not going to remain in the U.S. This is where we have coached people who have families in the U.S. They have all the entire family in the U.S. But they were able to get their visas because we were able, like they were able to build a good story we're able to help them build a good story. And sometimes building a good story coming with having interactions. There was one guy I coached who came to a community college. He was being sponsored by his sister. This guy has been out of school for 12 years. But he's into printing in uh, Edum Kumasi. And the printing is a family uh, printing shop that, that has been there for a long time. And he's the only one in Ghana who is managing it along with uh, one of his brothers. So there are two. Just that the brother is uh, now entering into the university. But he needed to, 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 to advance his knowledge. In, he said, uh, I think it was 3D printing, design and printing. Some, that was the course he was coming to do. And it was the sister who was sponsoring him like you. you. But we were able to prove why he will return. We were able to prove why the sister was sponsoring him. Because in actual, in, uh, 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 in truth, the company or the, the printing press that he was working for belonged to the sister. And he had documents. He had proof that the sister owned the printing press, which is one, one of the biggest in terms of size in Kumasi. And the consular believed that if your sister have this big printing press, that's the job you've been doing for the past 12 years. And you are coming to do 3D printing. Uh, and the purpose is to go back and polish your printing, and your sister have enough money, why don't I give you the visa? So it depends on the story that you tell and how you tell it. How do I prove ties with the fact that I'm married and I have a, ch a child uh, uh, concretely? Yes, yeah, so if you're married, as I, as I said, it's good. But that alone is not enough. It depends on how you present it, right? I remember... Uh, because we've been doing a lot of coaching with, with students, we sometimes some of the story pop up in my head. There was one student who was coming to uh, for for visa interview, and for her, she he rescheduled his visa. Uh, I think to uh, his his start date was I think 13th August. His school start date was 13th August. He had an interview for somewhere I think in June. Then he rescheduled and went for the interview somewhere in 17th August. Then he took 
a late arrival letter from the school. So when he went, the consul asked him, why is he going to, why is he going at that time? Like school has started. Then he explained that he has a wife and the wife was due, the wife was pregnant and the wife was due, uh, I think a day before, uh, he, uh, before his interview date. So he had to reschedule the interview. And after he rescheduled, he couldn't get another date. He couldn't get another date to get his visa. And it was the first time they were he was coming to uh, uh, become a father. And he couldn't risk it. Like, he couldn't at choose attending the interview over being a father. And that alone got his visa approved. Right? So even though he is married, it is the story around his marriage. There are some people who go for the interview and the consulates are silent. As soon as you tell them you are married, you have kids, the consular believe that the circumstances surrounding the kind of school you are coming to, the kind of job you are coming to do, the funding that you have, you will return because you have family. And that is a family tie. But what I'm saying is that it is not enough to have a wife or a child. Because if you're a student and you have a wife or a child, you can, after you get your visa, you can, they can apply for F2. So as a student, having a child and a wife is not, it's not, it's not an enough time, right? For people who are coming for a short trip, if you are coming for a visitation, if you are coming for a conference, if you are coming for business visits, and you tell the consular you have a wife, you have a, you have children, that is a strong tie. That one, you are you are coming for two weeks and you have a you have family. The consular even know that when he give you the visa, you can't work with the visa. So what is the point? And in this case, it also depends on the status of, of the man. If the man is if the man is doing something responsible, if the man is working, the consular will know that no responsible working man in their in their mind will abandon their family, go to conference in the US and, and, and overstay. Right? So it all depends on the story you tell and how you tell it. And especially even the kind the kind of purpose that uh, to which you are coming, uh, what you are coming to do in the US, actually. Okay. Thank you, Enoch, for that question. Let me go through. Uh, uh, I will try and answer everybody's question. Okay, this is Titus again. Say, hey, nice, nice talk, Alfred. Titus, this long time, big man. Yeah, Titus, good to see you. Let's link up. Uh, we need to talk. Uh, good to hear from you. Kwabena uh, Ousu says, I have admission and a graduate assistantship position leaving me a deficit of 10,000. Is it advice to show all deficits as sele, is it sele, sina, do funding or add my wife as a family fund, as a family man? Well, it depends on the, on the situation around your studies. And the deficit that you are having, where is it coming from? Is it coming from, uh, what do you call it? Living expenses. If your assistantship pays your tuition, that is a good point to say that, hey, I got a graduate assistantship that pays my tuition. I have a deficit of 10,000 Ghana CDs or $10,000, sorry, and my wife and I will be paying. I've been working in this field or my wife has been working in this world and she is willing to support me to pay the deficit, which is not too much for us to pay. That shouldn't be an issue. Ten thousand dollars is not a big money when you, when you, when you are your tuition have been paid and you have a deficit of ten thousand. It, it's it's not something that the consular believe that you cannot pay because already you are coming to school for free. So your responsibility to cater yourself for the for for the for for uh, your responsibility to pay ten thousand it shouldn't be something that should get your visa denied. So when your visa is denied, it's not because the consular believe you cannot pay $10,000. No, because you don't even have to pay the $10,000 at once. You are paying it monthly. If you are divided, it means that you have, you have to raise $1,000 a month, which is not difficult to raise. So I don't think that should be an issue for you. But how you prepare, how you answer the questions, that surrounds your funding. That surrounds what you are coming to do. That surrounds where your wife's money is coming from. Those are the key things that you must uh, think about Kobna. And as I said, if you have any concern, if you want one-on-one -on -one discussion, if you want us to talk more about some of these specific issues and listen and know much about your contest, one thing people don't know about the process is contest. What works for me will not work for you. And if I don't know contest, contest about your studies, your, your visits and who you are and all that, 
it is sometimes difficult to give a definite personalized answer for your case. So sometimes that's why we try to give you the rule, give you the general requirements, give you some examples and look at that to shape your own. Although sometimes it doesn't work for everybody, uh, but in most cases it, it helps for most people. Thank you for speaking about my second master's issue in China. Yeah, Eric, yeah. Uh, I, I, I wish you all the best. I hope you get your visa and I believe you, you, you deserve to get a visa. Hello, is it advisable to apply with my family, wife and daughter moving from UK but originally from Nigeria? Yes, we have coached a lot of people who moved to UK for either they went as nurses or they went to study or they, they, are, they are living in the UK with their husband and they, they, are, they have gotten admission to come. So it is okay to apply from the U, U, UK. But the question is that what is your status in, in UK, right? That is the first question. Uh, thing that the consular will be concerned about. What are you doing here? Why are you in the UK? And try to think about how you can answer some of these questions on that. And also, what are you coming to do in the US? Uh, what do you do in UK? And when you are going for an interview in a place like that, those questions are key. Sometimes the focus is not much on what you are coming to do in the US. But the focus is much on what you are doing in the UK. Because the consular can assess what you are doing in, in UK to determine whether you are responsible immigrants or not. If you have already overstayed in UK or abused your visa in UK, automatically you don't qualify for the US visa, even if Joe Biden is the one who is sponsoring you. Because the condition under which you are coming for, for the visa in UK is, 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 is false or it doesn't hold to the consular. So what are you doing in UK? Why, uh, why are you coming with your children and all that? Uh, your wife and daughter, very important. What are you coming to do? Sometimes what you are doing in UK, what you are coming to do will also make sense why you should bring your family, right? Uh, there are so many people who come, who go to the embassy with their families, whether they are coming for master's or PhD. And it depends, all depends on the story that you tell, right? So think about it in that regard. Uh, uncle's work is different from what I'm about to study. Example, he worked as, as an engineer in Shell, whilst I'm about to study master's in social work. As I have always said, sometimes when, when we are answering questions like this or we are, we are making the video, we try to generalize so many things. And specifically, some of the issues may not apply to everybody, right? So in your case, you don't have to necessarily, if your uncle is doing a certain kind of business, you don't have to come and study something that relates to his business. It, that is not a requirement. That is not what I mean when I say what benefits will your uncle, uh, what benefits your uncle benefit your uncle will get that is not what i mean what i mean is that there's always there's a reason why somebody is sponsoring you and no matter how difficult it is to find a reason there is a reason <laughs> right let me give another answer uh, another uh, uh, example that comes to mind this is also an example that came or uh, an issue that that i encountered with working with another student he was being sponsored sponsored by his uncle right but unfortunately, his parents are late. And his parents, were they were really rich when they were alive. And by the time they died, the, the, the guy was in, in high school also. So it is the uncle who took over the business and everything. And, and that is why the uncle is sponsoring him. So the uncle is sponsoring him actually not from his, his, own, his own pocket. The uncle is sponsoring him from the, the, the boy's parents' money that the uncle took over as a, a, a nurse of king in that context, right? So sometimes it all depends on the story, on who you are. That's why I, I always say that we need, sometimes we need to get specific background to, to answer specific questions. So you don't have to do study a program that relates with the work of your uncle. No, you can study a program that is unrelated but your uncle will be interested in sponsoring you because, for example, in your school, you were the top student and your uncle promised that he will sponsor you. You can, you, you, your uncle may sponsor you basically uh, because your parents don't have enough funds, but your uncle have enough funds. He has no children. He's sponsoring you. Or, so there are so many ways we can talk about, about some of these things. But the bottom line is that you don't have to study a program that relates to what your uncle is doing or what your sponsor is doing in order to prove that your sponsor is uh, truly sponsoring you. Okay, this is from Inzudu. 
uh, forgive me if I am not able to pronounce your name. How do I prove uh, Tyson's is self-sponsored? And for me, I really like self-sponsored, right? If you are self-sponsored, it means that you've been able to work enough to get money. And you are telling the consoler that what you are going to study is going to advance your career, is going to give you enough. It's just like an investment. So why would why should the controller give you the visa, right? How do you convince the controller that what you are doing now is enough, and that if he give you the visa and you go and study, when you come you raise more because you have been able to save for the past few years. Recently we called somebody who was working with Ghana Commercial Bank and she was coming for she was going for interview smaller than herself MBA, and she explained why she's going to do MBA in insurance because he realized. The, the, the insurance company, the insurance industry uh, in the banking sector and its failures and, and challenges and all that. And she has saved enough as a banker to go and study to advance himself and come and work in the insurance department of a bank. So she's using her job, her current job, that has been, that has been helpful in saving the money he, she's using to sponsor herself, she's using the same job as a tie to her home country. She's not creating that job. So that alone is a strong tie that you can use. Uh, uh, is, it, uh, is it okay to... Get a steady leave for two and a half years duration from my working place and mention same as supporting funds. It depends if your if your company is sponsoring you and you have actually given you the steady leave letter that the consular can confirm. Why not? It is okay, but I always tell people, uh, what is the condition of the steady leave? Is it is the steady leave, is the steady leave tied to your scholarship and all that? Because sometimes the embassy do not care about the steady leave. Because having a steady leave alone from a company does not prove ties. Because steady leave is not a commitment. You can you can resign anytime. You can say, go, I, I, I found a new job. So it depends on the story you tell. If you're explaining that I'm working with this company who is willing to sponsor me and they have given me a steady leave to study with sponsorship to, re, to go and do this specific studies. And you explain why you are going to do this specific studies. Right, uh, and and uh, that is very very important. There was a guy uh, uh, we coach who was coming to do. Is it agri? Agri? It it has to do with the chemicals that we use to 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 spray cocos, and we use to the weedy side and the pesticide and all that. And he argued that he's working with a Chinese company in Ghana who is into that chemical, and. In the company, all those who are working on the chemicals are Chinese. And he believed that he has been in the company for a long time to, 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 to enter into the field and open the market to Ghan indigenous Ghanaians. So he wanted to come and start this advanced program for a period of one year so that he can return to, to, to his home country to go and study. So it, it depends on what you are coming to study. Very, very important. Even if your company is sponsoring you, why? It's not, it's not just about my company sponsoring me. Why? The consulates have had those concerns over and over. So sometimes they go as far as going to verify. I've always said that they verify the information. They verify. The embassy verify. They can verify. And if they want to verify, they will verify. So it's not about getting let, support letters. No. Sometimes, in most cases, the consular will not, will not see the letter. Will not request for the letter but your oral response your oral command will tell the consular whether you deserve it or not thank you uh, this is from wendy thank you for your advice i have a bsc in human psychology but i intend to do my master's in psych is it physiotherapy the problem is that i don't have the financial capability to do so how have you already gotten a visa wendy sorry have you already gotten admission or you are yet to apply if you are yet to apply then you apply you don't have to Think about finance, financial now, right? Just try to put in a good application to a good school to get a good funding. That should be your target. Nathan, hello, say I'm applying for J1 training visa. Currently, I'm doing farming, so I'm struggling to fill on 
my present work. I'm thinking of selecting agriculture as my occupation. You thought, yes, you can you can put that as a, a occupation. Farming is a decent job, right? I know somebody who went for interview said his father is into farming, and his father is into uh, animal farming and uh, vegetable plantation, just like John Dumelo is doing. But his father's own is not as big as John Dumelo, right? So he's into animal farming, rabbits, grass cutter, uh, those kind of animals, pig, piggy, and uh, he, he uh, the father also is into tomatoes, onion, those kind of vegetables. And that's that's what so farming is is, is a decent uh, uh, occupation. The intro you said you can say to the consular, can I get example if I'm applying as a tourist? Intro. What do you mean by intro? I've said a whole lot, so I've got, I forgot. Can you be specific? What do you mean by intro? Can I get a discount offer or possible free LO? coaching from you please reach out to us we have discount cabinet uh that we can offer you would they also uh, this is from nana sewa would they buy the idea of friends sponsoring you what are your chances of approval you see yes your friend can sponsor you but why that is the most important thing that is why the the far the relationship the lesser the unlike it is a little bit unlikely to get a visa if the relationship to, to the sponsor is really huge. And it depends on the amount involved. If you are telling me your friend is giving you $40,000, that is huge. But it is okay to say, I've gotten graduate assistantship and all that, but I needed $5,000. So I spoke to a good friend and he was willing to sponsor me. Actually, the money is given to me is a soft loan, a loan without interest. I'll pay this money back to him after my father's social security is cleared. Look at this. A very good way of demonstrating why your friend is sponsoring you, right? He's sponsoring you because you have you're expecting money from your father's social security, which I've not cleared. And you pay the money back. It's not like it's a free money. And the money is small, five thousand dollars. So it depends on, on the kind of uh the, the money involved and all that. Isaac Alpha, nice one. <laughs> good to see you, senior man. <laughs> Uh, is it Isaac? I feel I know. I know it's him. Look at look at the face. <laughs> Hello, I'm a pastor, a counselor. I have a master's in counseling. Okay, I've been admitted into an MSc slash PhD family therapy program for funding. Can I use an apartment appointment letter and absence of leave as a strong tie? Yeah, I think even the mere fact that you are a pastor is enough ties. If you demonstrate and 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 you speak well, right? You are a pastor. Where? What, what have you been doing and how is what you are going to study relevant to your, your current work? Because the truth is that in most cases, the embassies will not check your, your letters. The American embassy, the purpose of your visa interview is not document inspection. The purpose of the visa interview is for, that's what's called visa interview, oral response. They ask you questions, you respond. If they have doubt, they, ask, they request for evidence. If you are going to Canada, then you submit documents. So the stronger your document, the better. But in the US, it doesn't mean you don't go with the document. But your focus is not on the document. You, because in most cases, they don't have time to check the document. Then we are, I have a video on why the consulates don't check the document. Because in most cases, and I said in most cases, being careful, knowing that not, in, not all cases. In most cases, letters are fraud. Uh, or they are not true letters. They are they are con, con, uh, uh, prepared by people. Uh, so consulates do not believe in them. And also the consulates do not have time to go through a bunch of letters and documents. Look at the number of people who go for interview in US, US interview in Ghana, over 200 a day. Assuming consular is checking everybody's land document, they will not have time. The interview is within two to three minutes. Some people, like 30 seconds, as fast as, you see, if I, yeah. You don't have to go there. It's like, quick. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm thinking in a certain way. I have to be in this way. So sometimes they don't check, Pastor. So yes, carry the letter, but let your profession, the way you said it, I am I am a pastor, right? I have masters in counseling. I've been doing counseling for the past 15 years. Perhaps the reason why you are going to study family therapy. It's because of the fam is the experience you have had with your church members, 
family issues, marriage issues. These are big issues that are dividing families, that are bringing uh, uh, a lot of uh, leading people into poverty and so much. Family therapy is a big area that is neglected in Ghana or in Africa. And you can focus on your experience in your church and your, your experience with this and what is motivating you to do uh, some of this, uh, to come and study this program. As, as, as you can concentrate on that and use that as your ties to your home country. I think for you as a pastor, uh, I don't know your family issue and all that or your family's background, whether you are married or the kind of child, but I believe uh, you are full fund, uh, fully funded. You are coming to study family therapy. You're already a counselor. It makes sense because we don't have a lot of counseling. Most of our pastors in Africa are not trained counselors. They, they just, they can read and interpret the Bible and pray and they assume they can counsel married people. They assume they can counsel people on finance. But you, you are going to seek training. That alone is enough, right? You are going to seek training for a specific purpose. And that is what you should highlight and let the consular know who you are as a pastor, what you have been dealing with, and why you are going to study this program, and what you will do with it when you return to your home country. This is all the consular is expecting from you. Sometimes it is easier said than done because I remember when I was also doing my, my visa interview, it was difficult to bring some of these things together. I have the skills. Sorry, I have the, the story. But it was difficult to bring them together. And I, I understand that sometimes most of you have a perfect background, but you don't have the means to bring the stories together. So uh, that's why we encourage you that sometimes you, you need to reach out to a third party, reach out to us, and let us see if we can help you. Because sometimes you need somebody to, to be a external party to advise. That is why we have coaches. That's why we have counselors like yourself, Pastor. Sometimes when we are dealing with issues as youth in the church and we are struggling, we come to you, right? So that you have uh, your, your, your second opinion and, and experience to advise. So if you need help, please reach out and we'll be happy to help you. Hello, Alfred. So I, I intend at tech company here in Nigeria where I got a retainment offer. Please, how can I prove home ties? And I also have a gap of CCL from when I finished uh, secondary school. As I said, always carry the letter with you. But your concern is not to show the letter. Sorry. Your concern is rather communicate what is in the letter to the consular. That would be convincing. Because in about 80%, in if you take 100 people who go for the interview, about 85 of them, the consular will not ask for documents. Right? So think about it that way. Most of the times, we go for the interview and we put trust in our documents than in our story. Your documents are good, but they, will not, they might not even check. They don't have time to check. So translate what is on the document into your oral speech, right? If you have a letter, retainment letter, for what? Retainment for what? Perhaps there's a specific problem in where you are working for, you've been working for six years. Because of that, the company is willing to even retain you to go when, you, when you are done with your school. So that is the part you want the consular to hear. The part where your course you are going to study is important and will be relevant to the company. Not just saying my course is relevant, giving specific reason why it will be relevant. And it is basically telling the consular about the retainment letter. And if the consular says, okay, do you have, do you have any proof? Then you can show the retainment, retainment letter, right? Okay. Retainment, that's what you call it. Okay. Nana Kofi, Senior Alfred. I reached out earlier today. How can I present an endorsement letter from the school to the VO in a manner not <laughs> the same questions? How can you present endorsement letter? You don't need an endorsement letter to get a visa. And I tell you, sometimes some of these things, it bores the consoles. So. <laughs> Listen, let me give you an example. Assuming you're a consoler, okay? You are interviewing students. Everybody comes. Now they give oral response. Then you come and you tell me you have endorsement letter from your school. So what? Endorsement letter, endorsing what? Right? So the purpose of the interview, the consular is not there. You see, at the interview, all that the consular needs to clarify about third party is that the school you are coming to is genuine. The, the letter you have, your offer, your I-20 is genuine. Truly, you are coming to the school. As soon as that is established, that is the credibility of the school is established. The next thing is about the credibility of you, the person. 
and for the credibility of you, the person, the consular is not expecting any other person to prove the credibility by you. You must tell the consular why you need the visa. The consular do not need you to give him a visa, to give him a letter telling him why you need a visa. He wants you to tell him, convince him. That is why it is an interview, just like going for an interview, a job interview. No matter the recommendation letters, endorsement letters people have written about you, it is you who must prove at, to the panel that you deserve the job. And until you do that, it will confirm or, the, uh, or, or, or not confirm the letters that the, uh, your, your, your recommenders have written. So please, I, will, I, I, I cannot uh, over, uh, overemphasize this enough. You don't need to be showing documents. You don't need to be focusing on how can I present documents? How can I do that? But in any case, if you still think you still need to present a document, for whatsoever, whatsoever reason, you can politely tell the consular that, please, I don't know the circumstances surrounding that endorsement letter. So it becomes difficult. I think I, I, I answered it in the Telegram page, which you can check uh, in that regard. I think I answered it in the Telegram page. So check it. Please, is, is it advisable to go on an Empower loan as my principal source of funding? There are so many ways you can prove of funds. And of course, loans are part of, of it. Whether it is an Empower, whether it's a personal loan, whether it's from a bank or wherever, it depends on proving why you are coming to study the program, how you can pay the loan, or what is relevant in the entire process. Sometimes, even at the interview, it doesn't come up to show how you, you, you pay the loan. But the kind of program you are, why you need the, why you need a, the degree, will tell the consular whether it makes sense to get a loan or not. Why you need the degree, it tell the consular. Let me give you an, a, an example. Assuming in a community, where there, there's no doctor, nothing. People are dying. And somebody say, okay, I want to go and study to become, go and study medicine, to become a doctor in this community. Just a hypothetical statement. So I've gone for a loan. Based on the community, the person wants to come and work for, getting a loan makes sense, right? So loans are also option. Uh, how is the job market like after a master's in public health in the U.S.? Unfortunately, I don't know the job market uh, in, in this sector, so I cannot help. SK. So I work with prison service and I'm going to the U.S. to study my master's in managing information system. However, I have my bachelor's degree in physics. How should I, how should I structure my home ties? So for you, you need to structure so many things, your purpose of study. And your purpose of study will determine where your money is coming from, and it was also it will also determine whether you come back or not. There's a video that will, uh, he will come back or he will death, right? So your purpose of study will determine whether you come back or you will death, you or not. So think about about it in that sense, right? So uh, proving home ties, I've explained, depends on so many factors. So think about it in that sense, my brother. If I applied for visitors visa for conference as a member of association and it's a self-sponsored, what do I use as a tie and how do I relate it? I also work with Federal Aviation and I'm married to. Of course. So for you, you are a member of an association, right? And the association is having a conference. For example, assuming I'm part of the uh, chartered accountants in Ghana, there's an association and I work somewhere as a chartered accountant or wherever I'm married, like in your case. Why do you need to come to the conference? Perhaps it is an annual conference and workshop for uh, members of the association to train you on new uh, international policies relating to the, the association or your work so that when you come back, you will be proficient in your work. You can sponsor yourself to go and, uh, to, to go and interact with people. Conferences are grounds for learning. They are grounds even to present your own research, to present your own uh, work and also learn from people. So it depends on how you prove it. I always say that B1, two, B, B1, B1, B2 visa is the easiest visa to get. If you're coming, if you're coming for conference, why are you coming for that conference? Why do you need it? And there are so many ways to prove it as a member of an associate, uh, association coming for that conference. And you are sponsoring yourself. It means that you are doing a good job, right? You have some source of income. So the kind of job you are doing is also a tie to your, to your country. 
And if you are married, what, are, what does your wife do? All those things connect to your, uh, to your ties, okay? Okay, I am a tutor at a nursing training. Can I use that as a tie? How can you use that? What if you did a teacher, a, a tutor at a nursing training? Are you coming for a visit? If you're coming for a visit, of course. Perhaps you are on vacation and you want to spend your vacation or come for conference or vacation, whatever in the US you are uh, you are teaching with a nursing school and all that. So it depends on the purpose. But if you are coming as a student, how do you use where you work as a teacher? As a tie, are you saying that you are coming to study so that after you return to go and teach there or what? I think that should be clarified. You can send us an email for more information about that. If you have worked for about more than 10 years, can you use a, a statement of yourself or your uncle? Huh? This question is very sub subjective. If you can sponsor yourself, then why don't you sponsor yourself? If you cannot sponsor yourself and you are You've worked for 10 years, you are married, you have kids, you are 30, 35 or 40 or whatever. You are a grown up, a beard grown up man like me, right? And you come to do master's, MBA, and we're saying your uncle is sponsoring you, you have family. You see, it doesn't make, it, does, it doesn't really support it so well. So try to try to make, make that connection. If you can sponsor yourself, that should be a, the best thing. If I ask how, if I'm asked, I think that's what you, if I'm, how do you intend to pay off your loan? Can I answer by saying I will use campus employment and then as one of, oh, no, no, you cannot say that. How do you intend to pay your loan? The question is, how much loan are we talking about? And for campus employment, how much are you going to get? And that is one of the uh, misconceptions out there. People think that they can get huge loans or get loans and pay with campus employment. As an international student, you are you are you qualify to work for 20 hours. Let's go, let's go to the calculation uh, calculator to work for 20 hours at Yale. You work for 19 because you must go for one hour break, right? So assuming you get the best offer, which is unlikely in most cases, those jobs are minimum pay job, minimum wage pay job. So $15, $16 in some schools, $9, $10. Unless you are a teaching assistant where you can get $20, $25, even some in some cases, most of the on campus job that have high uh, per hour rates have lower hours. So if you can get thirty dollars per uh, per hour, you can only do five five hours. But if it is fifteen dollars per hour, you can get twenty hours because the purpose of your studies, the purpose of that job, is not to make you rich. It is not a job that 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 gives you comfort. Gives you comfort. It is a job that sustains, pay your grocery, perhaps part of your rent, and make you comfortable and pay attention to your, your books without, without worrying about money. If on-campus job is that attractive, everyone wouldn't graduate. We will all be staying in school and be doing on-campus. So let's go to the calculator. 20 hours a week. Assuming they give you 20, right? It will give you how many? Times four. No, 20 hours, yes, times four. It will give you 80 hours. 80 hours times $20. You are receiving $1,600, okay? And this is unlikely. <laughs> Even people who are doing PhD, most, of, most PhD students do not get stipend as this. Assuming they take all your tax and you are left with $1,000. Now, as, as a student on loan, you need to pay your rent. Averagely, Assuming your rent is $500, which is also unlikely, depending on the state, right? But I want to just give out ourselves benefit of the doubt. $500. You are getting $500 left. You need to eat. You need to. So how can this money help you pay a loan of $40,000? That is the question you should ask yourself. And I did this calculation not just to scare you, not just to say, don't go, don't come with a loan. No. I did this calculation for you to know the reality. I have seen a lot of students here. I coached, I prepared, and they came. We were able to get a story to get a visa. But now they came after a few years. They, they, are in, they are debt trap. Their total loan is about 85000 And they have to pay monthly interest of some about $600, some about uh, $500. And 
they are they are struggling they are going crazy what i'm saying is that sometimes there are there are not enough information out there for some of you to make some of these decisions it is good to come to school with loan but sometimes you must ask yourself if you come from a family like mine where when i i uh, where i have responsibility i have to look back home because it is not all good home i have to also the letter i get i must remit something home in that case you you must ask yourself why must I study with loan when I can get a scholarship? When others are getting scholarship? So sometimes it is more about putting enough effort in your application to get a good offer. And again, I'm not saying you cannot go for a loan, but I just want you to have a broader overview about this idea of if I get an on-campus job. It depends. What if you don't even get an on-campus job? In my former school, Columbia, there were on-campus jobs, but they didn't get some. <laughs> right there are some schools because the on-campus jobs are not guaranteed that is why they don't show on your i-20 unless it is a teaching or graduate assistantship those are monies guaranteed for a specific purpose but on-campus jobs are not guaranteed there's no guarantee that you will get the job or there's no guarantee that the job will be there there are sometimes you start a job with a professor or with the library and after two months that project is has ended so there's no virtually no job you have to go and look for another job so please think about all this when you are making some of these decisions please can a canada a canada student visa holder who has not yet entered canada apply for f1 visa is that not a red flag since i already have a student yes so then when you go then you explain why you have a visitor's visa so you have a student visa to to, to come and study in canada but you still want to come and study in the u.s Perhaps it is not impossible. Perhaps plans have changed. Perhaps you got a better offer in the U.S. Perhaps your research interests have changed. Perhaps the U.S. school was your first choice. All these are issues you can use as a reason. It doesn't mean you cannot get a visa, but it depends on how you, you, you show or you prove it, okay? Hi, Alfred. Does age matter in student visa acquisition? I have gotten admission into an undergraduate medical lab program. I'm in my early 30s, but I'm here to get my first degree. <laughs> yes and no, because yes, because sometimes how old you are can affect your visa, right? Because there are so many factors to consider in this case. Why do you want, why, why are, you, are you now coming back to school, right? who is funding, and all those questions are very relevant. And no, because the visa uh, application is, F1 visa application is not age-related. You can be 60 years and come for bachelor's. You can be 60 years and come for master's or PhD. It all depends on why you, why, why, why at this time. Very important. Hi, please. I got admitted uh, to study in US and I wrote that my uncle in the US is sponsoring me. Please, what are my chances of getting a visa? As everyone, your chances are 50 50. You can get a visa, you cannot get a visa. Okay, I work for a private hospital in Ghana and my CEO is sponsoring me. I have worked with him since 2020 when I completed. Okay, so you have to give reasons why your CEO, CEO is sponsoring you. I've gained admission this is from some of you. I've gained admission to Master of Accountancy. And I'm currently an accountant, accounting teacher at SHS level, uh, planning to take an assistant lecturer position when I return. Okay, assistant lecturer with master of accountancy. Okay, at what institution? Because in most cases, as a you you need PhD, higher degree for lect lectureship, right? So maybe you may have to rethink that. Uh, I don't know the context to which you are saying assistant lecturer. That's important. Hello, I have a fully funded scholarship, but proving ties to my country is not the problem. Since I'm not working now, I completed tertiary 2022 and national service 2023. As I said, if you are not working, I always advise people don't just go to the embassy and say you are not working. <laughs> if you are not working, find something to do. You can involve in a volunteer job or something. But fully funded scholarship is a good thing. So, uh, Kwesi, I want to encourage you to really put in the preparation to get the, this visa because. People struggle to get offers like yours. So please, if you need, like, reach out if you need specific help. Like, uh, in that case, especially if you are not working, how do we go about it? Perhaps we have to talk about research interests, 
what you were doing during your national service and all that to connect the thoughts for you. But I want you to really prepare well to get your visa. You don't have to let the opportunity go uh, because you didn't prepare well uh, to, to connect that aspect of your interview. Uh, I have about, I'm going to, about in the next five minutes, let me answer about two or three questions left then we will be done. Thank, uh, thank you all for joining. I've registered business in my home country and applying for an f visa. Can I sponsor myself for my business and my bank sitting? Well, you can. What form of business is that? There are some people who go to the embassy and they're like, I have a business. I'm sponsoring myself. And basically, it is like they are, they are emptying everything in their business to support themselves, to sponsor themselves. That is not a good thing. If the consular can see that you are basically... Uh, collapsing your business because you are coming to steady F1, steady, that's also a red flag, right? So whilst you can sponsor yourself from your business, you must do it in a way that will still mean that the business is sustainable for you to go back, uh, come and steady and go back to the business, okay? Uh, Collins. Um... Collins, why we say, please, they accept a bond with my organization as a tie. They are not even going to look at those letters and those bonds. So don't even worry yourself. Uh, what, what, what is a bond? Like, what's the definition of a bond? <laughs> even when I'm coming, the company I'm working with, they've given me a bond. They have signed a bond letter. Bond in Africa. Bond work. Bonds. Bond between who and who. What is the context of the bond? If a company is sponsoring all my studies and he's saying that we are paying $50,000 for you to go and study. And as part of that, we are giving you this, uh, we have this bond. That one, it makes sense. But if I work with the company and the company say, we want to sign a bond with you when they are not committing anything, that bond does not hold water. And as I said, the embassy, in your case, assuming you send a scholarship letter that says you are bonded, it is high likely that the consultants will check. The embassy will verify. Now they verify. So I want you to be aware of that. Okay. How do you intend to repay your loan? I've answered this question, Eric Burma. Video Games. I was doing my internship in his company and I have been promoted to a senior role. Can I use that to study in the US to enhance my skills so I can come back to take the role? Well, you don't go and study to come back to take a role. I've always said in our videos that when you go to the embassy, don't say I'm going to study because I'll return and come and take up a rule. That is not a reason. When you take up the rule, what will you do? Why would that degree make you successful in the rule? That is what the consular is expecting. Okay. So it is about the problems that you will solve, the how the quality you will bring, the improvement and the changes, and how your education will make whoever is admitting or accepting you in their company better than it was before. That is what the consulates are interested in. I was willing to travel to U.S. for my vacation. How can I? Uh, I am willing. Okay. How can I present my highlight to the view that I, I will return to my country after short stay in the country? How can I prove my ties to my home country? Yes. If you, are, you, you want to travel to the U.S. for a vacation, it must be, it should be that you are doing a good job because Visiting the U.S. for a vacation is, is luxurious. It's not for everyone, okay? So uh, for you, a good job is important. Can I say that I have a scholarship from the school? That's why I want to apply for F1 visa enough. It depends on the circumstances. Uh, Papa Asundrinka, this is from uh, Papa Francis. Okay. Thank you, guys. It is uh, We've done one hour, 30 minutes for your time. Let's continue on the Telegram page. Continue. Send your questions. Uh, on the telegram page and we will all respond thank you for uh, for joining us uh, i really really uh, appreciate your time please if you want to uh please if you if you need uh one-on-one -on -one discussion reach out reach out to us at bayit lamad b-a-e-t-l-a-m-d nina boom they are all together at gmail.com or www.baselamadedu.com. Go to contact. You can see in the chat box, right, uh, our contact and everything, uh, info, every information is there. Thank you for your time and God bless you.
Uh, we will meet same time next week. Thank you.